Hey everybody, it's Flake. I've got a deck for you now that Crimson Curse is upon us. I figured what better place to start than with Vampires. Now this is a deck that I've been playing on ladder successfully and not seeing this variant, this type of direction with Vampires very much. It relies a little on, well, relies a lot actually on Crimson Curse and we're having a lot of fun with it. Long rounds, lots of fun, lots of Vampires, big boards, lots of wins. All right, so I'll take you through the deck and uh, give you a little bit of a rundown of the cards and the selections, and then we'll sort of go through the strategy of it all. But uh, basically, really quickly, we'll go with obviously the centerpiece being the Crimson Curse, uh, which destroy unit, get, blo uh, get Blood Moon on for one turn per uh, strength of the unit that you sacrificed. Uh, and then we'll go with the Vampire build, which is Detlaf Higher Vampire. This is a death, uh, has a, the... Death Wish, which is to summon it again on the same row three times. So usually this is what you're connecting with your Crimson Curse to make sure that you're not losing value. Uh, we've got Proto Fledder. This is a good card. Uh, could have a high potential, like a ceiling of about 10 for 10 provision, which is a good conversion rate. Uh, but at the same time, it's also three damage. So it's a good removal tool as well uh, with your debt laugh can uh, connect to remove uh, five strength units. So that's pretty good. Catacan, this was my reveal card. So I'm feeling a little bit proud of it, but it is an excellent card. Again, with the vampire token or tagline rather, great, great card. It's got thrive for bonus, drops an extra, uh, sorry, drops an extra uh, vampire on the board in the form of an Ekimara. Got that card in there. Regis Bloodlust, which might be one of the best cards that comes out of this set. The damage for and banish it if it uh, kills what it's uh, dealing with. So there's a lot of cards that might come back from the grave, and this could definitely just deal with that. For instance, your opponent's uh, dead laugh. <laughs> like, you know, anything that uh, you suspect might come back, this is actually just ruins ruin. Uh, pardon the pun there from Jagras, but uh, that is... Um, this is a great, great card, Regis Bloodlust. You see it not just in vampire builds, but in all kinds of other uh, uh, cards as well. We've got the, uh, I call them the Monster Witchers, the Wispus, Bruis, Weavis. These are three well-priced cards at eight provision, but provide so much value. Even the Consume, which a lot of people think is usually the first play you'd make, is you make the Consume play, but a lot of the times uh, Consuming um, you might want to consume extra things, consuming your debt laugh, consuming your harpy egg, et cetera, et cetera. So the consume ability on here is not necessarily, Bruis is not always the first thing you drop. Um, nonetheless, these three always uh, get some good value. And, um, you know, even if you're cornered into a short round, if they're pushing you in round two, holding onto the Bruis, uh, Bruis and Weavis and Wispus or any two of the three usually can get you some good value for a short round. All right, Queen of the Night, a great card. Purify on the range row, which already has some great um, implications. For instance, if your debt laugh gets locked, you can go ahead and purify. But at the same time, you can throw up on the melee row for a relatively long round. Four turns at least, getting four uh, bleed value. So you're getting possible nine value out of an eight provision card. She's got the vampire tag to her, so she's going to grow under moonlight, under the blood moon. So there's some good value over there. Queen of the Night is, in my opinion, usually an auto-include. Uh, at least in this build, but I mean, I could see this be card being played just for the purify factor and the nine point ceiling in a lot of different decks. All right, off to the bronzes now. Uh, oh, actually, hold on. Nagelfar. I always have trouble uh, pronouncing this card. Nonetheless, Nagelfar. Look at the top two gold cards from your deck and play one and place the other on top. This is to guarantee. Usually you're thinning out relatively well. You're playing a lot of your bronzes. You're going to be uh, getting the cards you need for the most part. Naglfar is there to make sure that you have Crimson Curse. Um, it's an extra little boost, uh, an extra draw for Crimson Curse if necessary. Crimson Curse really, really, really gets the jam going in this. Um, so you want to make sure you have it. I've tried this deck with Kingfisher, but usually Kingfisher is such a dead draw in round three. And, and I've had trouble drawing it. So I like Naglfar instead. Uh, I've played both versions, and I much prefer the Nagelfar version. Uh, all right, down the rows. Now let's go to the bronzes. Now, uh, we've tried this with a whole bunch of different bronze packages. We've tried a vampire-centric one. We've tried a non-vampire-centric one. We've tried a little hybrid, and that's kind of where we settled on, getting the best possible value of thinning, uh, best possible ceilings for your bronzes, your four drops, etc. And this is what we've settled on. So 
two times Bruxa, which is kind of, I call it the bad Tinder date. Uh, two times Bruxa. Uh, I've got two times Plumard. Uh, we've got the Foglets, which uh, usually, I mean, the Foglets are just easy thinning. Uh, and you could uh, pair up the Foglets with either your Cyclops, which I've got two of. Cyclops can go ahead, toss your uh, Harpy Egg. I have one of those. And, or, I mean, there's so many different activators. Um, so for the Foglet or let's say the Harpy Egg, how do we get it done? Well, uh, we've got the Cyclops that we can toss around, but we also got the Flutter. Now, Flutter is kind of like a, uh, imagine it kind of like a Griffin, where the Griffin is seven, uh, seven provision for eight points. This is uh, a similar thing where you need to play it and destroy something. The difference is, is that if you're the, the Griffin will play onto a row with nothing on it and just disappear and dissipate. This, however, can be played independently if you just need to drop something on round two and move on. This, however, can deploy, uh, destroy an egg, destroy a foglet, uh, you know, get that trigger going, and then has vitality. So it'll grow up to a seven uh, strength unit which is similar in, in range for the eight point Griffin, but at the same time, it'll take a little time. The difference of course, is that it's saving you some provision costs. So I've uh, put these guys in and they are of course vampires. So they'll uh, thrive under the moonlight. Uh, and then the Alp, the Alp is such a great card at late game. You usually do not want to uh, keep these in your early hand if you have other uh, options to get other bronzes, obviously, but this is something that uh, has such great implications late game. It under When played on her Moonlight Row, she'll deal two damage, but also drain an enemy by two, meaning that she'll become a five dealing two damage. So she is worth seven, uh, seven points for five provision. That's some great, great value in that slot. Again, vampire, she'll grow, things are great. So, and of course, again, extra thinning with some good tempo is the Wild Hunt Rider. Uh, times two. So that's the package. We'll go through it one more time. Crimson Curse, Nagelfar, Detlaf Higher Vampire, Protofletter, Catacan, Regis Bloodlust, Wispus Bruis Weavis, Queen of the Night, two Cyclops, two Wild Hunt Riders, one Harpy Egg, two Fledders, two Alps, two Foglets, two Plumards, and two Bruxes. Now you can kind of play around with how you want to play the... Um, the uh, the bronze package here, but the basic strategy of this deck is is you want the long round, and a lot of the decks that are playing now don't typically bleed. Usually, the decks that bleed are like Gurnacora and such. But I'm playing this right now at rank seven, six or seven, and uh, I'm not encountering many decks, or at least on the route to it from ten to six, uh, there wasn't there weren't many decks that were bleeding me out. I was giving up round one fairly easily i was rarely winning round one because i wanted a long uh late round and nobody bleeds so uh, even without last say this deck does some decent damage so what you want to do in the early round is you know play your foglet if you can drop your wild hunt riders if they're going to be there uh you know uh trigger your foglets thin out the deck as much as possible play your bronzes there's no bronzes that are any better or any worse in round uh, three. I mean, besides the Alp. The Alp is pretty much the one card that if you can, you wanna hang on to it in uh, in late game. Uh, if you're stuck with bronzes, the Alp is what you want to hang on to if you ever have to make a choice. Otherwise, everything else is relatively um, you know, expendable in the first two rounds. Um, I would even suggest if it's if it looks like you can possibly steal a round, you can play your, uh, your Brewis Wispus Weavis, either way. Um, what you want to hang on to, the, the key cards for round three are going to typically be Crimson Curse, Detlaf Higher Vampire, uh, Regis Bloodlust, uh, Queen of the Night, you want to make sure, and Catacan typically. Those are your main um, point getters uh, for the late round. Now, usually, probably in 90% of my games, I've played them with eight or plus cards in round three. Very rarely have I played... Um, round threes with this deck where I have gone in with five or less cards. Uh, and even in those games, I've won because when you see them bleeding, you want to drop uh, Crimson Curse in round two, and then they kind of lose track really fast. I have been bled in round two where I dropped Crimson Curse um, when I suspected that they were going to bleed me. And then I ended up with uh, getting out of that round unscathed and then won with a, you know, uh, Wispus Weavis kind of combination with Regis and uh and such but this deck really jams in the late round 
basically, so the, the game plan for this deck that I've been playing is if you have a nine or 10 card round three, it's you drop your, um, you drop your Detlaf Higher Vampire, as you can see here with five strength and the uh, Death Wish ability, drop him on your next play, uh, assuming he goes unscathed, you will drop your Weavis on it to boost it to seven. And then the next turn, what you're doing is you're Crimson Cursing the seven strength Detlaf to give you the remainder of your game uh, for the remaining seven cards or seven turns, you will have Moonlight. Meaning that those seven turns means 28 strength conversion on Crimson Curse, assuming you have a vampire in each row. And then from that point onward, it's all about reaction and playing. Now your Detlaf charges, I would usually like to save them for the late game, use them sparingly in, uh, in early rounds. If you need to use them, use them to kill stuff that's important. But typically you have removal options with Cyclops, you have removal options with Regis Bloodlust. And uh, if necessary, you can always go ahead and, uh, you know, once the higher vampire in round three has been used, he's down to two charges, you have other options to, to make use of that ability. You can consume it for the power, he'll come back. You can toss him with uh, Cyclops for extra value. No big deal. You can use a Fledger on him to uh, as, uh, as just fodder for the Fledger to hit the board. No big deal. Now, like I said, this deck that I've been playing, um, not many people are playing Crimson Curse. So Blood Moon is not really all that popular right now. It's not being, um, uh, it hasn't been exposed yet. But people will eventually start bleeding this deck out in round two knowing. And you're out in that sense is once you see them drop, uh, a, you know, start bleeding you out, then hit Crimson Curse as soon as possible and try to get the hell out of there. Um, usually that's how that goes. Now, a lot of people have also figured out that if you keep your vampire, to, uh, your strength totals low, you won't get much value off Crimson Curse, but usually between four or five turns of Crimson Curse is enough to put you over the top. This deck that I've been playing has been absolutely dis dismantling Svebold decks by 20 points or plus. Very rarely has it been under 10 points. I've beaten uh, plenty of Harmony decks that want to go the distance with this deck because nobody's playing um, you know, weather or moonlight disruption. Nobody's dropping in a, a fog just to ruin a row or, uh, you know, dropping in a, um, uh, a Ragnarug or something. All those effects that remove row effects usually do so on your own side of the board. So when they play it against you, when they play that iris to remove row, aside, uh, row effects, that's only on their side. So you're untouched. So there's very few things right now that are disrupting Crimson Curse. I, wouldn't su I would suspect that if Crimson Curse becomes popular, people might be teching in a fog or two to see how that goes. But uh, nonetheless, this has been very, very good. You guys can play around with it and see how you like it. Uh, but uh, this is the basic format of the deck that I have been using. So that's it, Blood Moon, Crimson Curse, and Vampires, and all that Twilight Dracula nonsense. And it's been working out, um, having a little bit more trouble as we go, as people start bleeding me with this deck. But uh, it's something different, something to try out. Uh, Detlaf doesn't necessarily have to be just about point slam and stuff like that. I mean, it's a great control option, but you do generate a ton of points. Till start, people start figuring out that, uh, you know, Blood Moon can really, really uh, overpower a board and get overwhelming. You know, ride the wave, make it happen. So. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been a deck guide for Crimson Curse, Vampires, Dead Laugh, and all that cool stuff. My name is Flake. Be sure to hit the subscribe button. Go ahead and check me out on Twitch, twitch.tv slash watchflake, or on Twitter, at watchflake. Be kind, have a good one, and I will see you very soon. Adios.